Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Cloud Security Alliance UK chapters Identity in the Cloud series. So the Cloud Security Alliance UK chapter. So this is our second talk, just a, a reminder on what we're doing. Uh, we're here to champion the Cloud Security Alliance overall organization's mission in the UK. Um, we do have a very active UK membership. We engage with a broad set of UK stakeholders and we're here to champion cloud training, education and awareness opportunities in the UK. We do survey the needs of our members. Um, so you'll see on LinkedIn, we, we, do, um, we do ask various questions about what you're looking for us and how we can support you. Um, and we do try and deliver programs to meet those needs. Um, we are doing, as part of the recent survey, um, a series of six talks. So this is going to be the second day on identity as it relates both to cloud and zero trust. And that's over the six consecutive Tuesdays. So the second one is today. And then uh, we're running through to the 17th of October. So today's talk is part two of our host, Paul Simmons, uh, talk about understanding identity. So this second session will focus on context and trust. If you did miss part one, you can catch up via our website and also our YouTube channel as well. And yeah, so on to Paul. Paul Simmons uh, is brilliant. He's, our, he's a longstanding board member of the Cloud Security Alliance UK chapter. And he is a director also of the Cloud Security Alliance uh, Europe as well. And he is CEO of the Global Identity Foundation. So he is, uh, we're really lucky to have him. He's doing the talk today. So uh, shall I hand over to you, Paul? Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, so as Shireen said, yeah, absolutely. If uh, you missed part one, then uh, you can catch up um, either via our, uh, our website, um, cloudsecurityalliance.org.uk uh, or on YouTube. Um, but I'm going to do a very quick recap of where we uh, got to in part one. Um, so what were the key points? Um, so first of all, forget IT. Um, and in fact, forget about IT for most of today. What we're talking about here is, um, you know, how actually what I, identity actually is. So identity, the I am me bit, my identity, my overall identity consists of many, many attributes. And humans, and also I would argue for IT, but humans split the attributes of our identity into logical groups, and we call them persona. They're facets of my overall identity. And by segmenting them as humans, we provide a level of privacy and potentially also control over those attributes. You do not need to know on this presentation my family persona, for example. Um, where attributes are issued by an authoritative source, providing them signed in real life, for example, my driver's license or my passport issued to me by UK government allows me as the entity to assert them as one or more signed attributes, and they have more provenance as a result when I assert them. And by authenticating those personas, my driving license has my picture on it, we can add a level of confidence that when I hand that over to the policeman who's just stopped me, he can look at the photo on my driver's license, look at me and say, yeah, this really is Paul Simmons's set of attributes and therefore provide confidence in those attributes. And if you understand that level of what we call immutability, how well is the wetware connected to the firmware, or in the case of a driver's license, the photo matching to the person standing in front of me, it provides a level of confidence in the entity. But as we're going to talk about, no level of confidence is 100%. So yes, this has little to do with IT, but actually if we start to understand identity properly, it allows us to design better and more secure IT systems. And this is what I showed you last time. What I, normal humans call identity 
actually consists of three distinct components. It's the authentication component. It's the sameness component. In other words, if you authenticate, it means that I am the same entity that when you first met me, am today, will be tomorrow. And on top of sameness, we tack personas and attributes. So that's your very brief recap. I said, if you want to look into more of that, go to the website, look at last week's presentation. So today I'm going to do two things. I'm going to look at how we consume attributes and understanding persona to derive context. And then we're going to look at risk. So identity needs context. So being presented with an attribute of my identity without some form of context is somewhere between meaningless and slightly useful. So if I hand you an attribute that says two meters 15, that's an attribute. But without a context of what that attribute is and who it belongs to, it is totally meaningless to you. You might guess that that's my height. It might not be. It might be something I've just made up. It might be something totally different. So being presented with an attribute of an identity without some form of context is, as I said, between meaningless and slightly useful. So let's give you an example. If I want to buy a bottle of whiskey and asserting my age, if I'm in person, yeah, obviously, we have an over 18 rule in the UK. We have an over 25 in the US. They look at me, they go, Gray, if I assert the attribute gray hair, yeah, because I've walked up in person, it's probably okay. Most places will serve me whiskey or let me buy a bottle of whiskey. No further attribute required. If I do it in Chicago, Chicago, interestingly, I found out to my cost has 100% mandatory carding. In other words, you need photo ID. Even, so you walk up to a bar and you go, gray hair, I'm over, 20, I'm over 21. And they go, tough, you still can't come in. I need photo ID. And you go, you have to be joking. Yeah, there is no way, as much as I might like to think I'm under 21, um, that I'm not. You have to have. So gray hair as an attribute is totally useless in Chicago. 100% mandatory carding. Yeah. If you're in the UK, certainly if you try to know in, in uh, Sainsbury's or somewhere like that, actually they have the under 25 year. If you look like you're under 25, they want photo ID with date of birth. So depending on the rules and everything else, asserting gray hair can be work, may not. If I try it over the internet, well, in some countries, just buy it. In some countries, with country-specific ID, you stand a chance. Um, and in some places, without being enrolled in their, their age verification system, probably not. So we have a problem, especially as we start trying to do it remotely rather than face-to-face. -face. So generally... It's a complete lottery when presenting attributes, certainly authoritative attributes. Um, and we need to look at why it sort of works face to face, generally fails miserably when you're not face to face or lots of compromise. So we need to understand who is truly authoritative for the attribute I'm asserting. So in my case, UK citizen. There are generally two authoritative documents issued by the UK government. So it's my passport and my driver's license. And because of international treaties, my passport generally works globally. But my driver's license less so, because actually I used to have a paper driver's license until just recently. I, I had to go up. I had to go up to the palace um, and my passport was in to get a visa. And so I had to turn my paper driver's license into a photo driver's license. When I had a paper driver's license and I got stopped um, it, by a, an American policeman, and I said in my best British accent, um, what did I do, officer? Because I did, generally didn't know why he'd stopped me. Um, 
and in my best British accent, handing over my UK passport and my paper driver's license. And he looked at my paper's driver's license, which says driver's license issued by the UK. He did not know what to do with that piece of paper. He just didn't. So there was no point doing anything other than telling me why I flouted the rule, which is I hadn't come to a complete stop at a four-way stop. And he basically said, learn your lesson, sir. You have to come to a complete and utter stop at a four-way American stop. Um, don't do it again and, and send me on my way. But we have a problem because the internet is global. And even the big UK banks, which are generally fairly joined up, probably more so than most in the world, are not consistent. So the banks have to do KYC, know your customer checks. Trust me, my corporate accounts are with Barclays. Going to Halifax, as I tried to do it after my father died, to do some stuff for the trust he'd set up for his grandchildren, my children. Um, and Halifax would not accept any assertion other than what they could validate themselves, even though we're fairly joined up as UK banks. So we have a real problem in getting accepted attributes from truly authoritative sources. And in real life, we assert an attribute from a persona. And obviously, often it's multiple attributes from disparate personas, but they're all linked as being mine. So the trick here, the entity is required to validate the entity that signed them to their level of satisfaction and validate that they belong to the entity asserting them. So in the case of Halifax, I had to go in with photo, you know, one piece of photo ID, either passport or driver's license, and then a utility bill, and then the bank account details and other bits and pieces. And they sit and go, yeah, absolutely. The photo matches the person. The, the document says Paul Simmons. The, the utility bill also says Paul Simmons. Um, and the other bits of information say, you know, the, in this case, the, the deed of trust says Paul Simmons is allowed to sign as a trustee on, on this trust. They all match. Therefore, we're happy. They take photocopies and it's a 10 minute process. Away we go. And why? Because the entity receiving them is able to understand them in context. So back to my whiskey over the Internet example. The contextual decision would be, if over 18 and if in the UK over 21, signed by the relevant government, they're prepared to pay for it. In other words, they've got a matching visa card that matches my address and we have a valid delivery address signed by the post office. And, you know, it's not a prohibited country, depending on what you're buying. So they have over the Internet some kind of contextual decision. And the thing you need to remember in all of this is that we tend to do on the internet binary authentication. Passes user authentication, use, username and password matches, binary one. But actually, in real life, authentication is never binary. So humans still have some level of confidence. So here's, you know, a crowd scene in New York. And you know, I spot someone in the distance and I'm going, I'm fairly sure that's Fred. Yeah, we went to the theatre on Sunday, actually two euros in front. We spotted someone's the back of someone's head and my wife went, I'm, that, that, that's our friends who live across the junction from us at uh, where I live. I'm fairly sure. And they tapped on the shoulder and sure enough it was. But humans do probabilities. We don't do absolutes. I'm fairly sure that's Fred. <clears throat> but in the IT world, we fall into the trap. And we're going to talk about more about this next week in terms of some of the pitfalls with, with identity, especially as it translates into ID. But authentication is never binary. And if you take nothing else away from this set of slides, remember that one. <clears throat> so let's add context is, into this identity triangle. So what humans refer to as identity is used to link persona and attributes to context. So, yes, how do I uniquely prove I'm me? How do I therefore attach that to being, yeah, it's the same person time and time again? Yeah, personas and attributes, the parts of that overall identity that I'm now going to share with you, 
in the context. So the parts of the overall identity that I share with you or derive, you can derive because you see me in the street or you meet me face to face and you therefore derive, yeah, he's probably just something over six foot, um, provide context. And context is that sort of group of attributes about that entity that we attach to the sameness. So how do we make risk-based decisions by understanding attributes in context? So I'm sure that we've all seen this. Yeah, it's the standard one that we trot out when we're doing risk. Risk equals impact, usually in dollars, times the probability of the thing happening. And I'm here to tell you today, it's garbage. It is not how we do risk. It is a complete and utter waste of time. Why? Well, this is why. So here's my street scene. Yeah. Nice sunny day. Absolutely. Someone walking down the street. There are cars. There are people out. It looks fairly nice. It's paved and everything else. If I'm going to walk down that street, I do a risk assessment based on environment and context. What about this one? Two o'clock in the morning. Strange part of the town. Am I going to walk down this alley? Well, it's got some street lights, so that's something. But your risk totally changes based on the environment and the context. It's got nothing to do with binary one authentication. It's risk is to do with environment and context. So what's my risk equation? Who am I? You know, am I, a, if you've been watching the Rugby World Cup, you know, am I a 28-year-old front row forward, um, in which case I'm built like a Brit whatever um or am i an 85 year old little old lady who's frail am i alone is there a bunch of us or is it just me what's the time of day are there alternative routes what's the area's history um is there street lighting what about policing and presence is it somewhere that the police avoid um am i a target in other words am i you know wearing a rolex and a suit and carrying a briefcase or a laptop all of that makes my personal risk decision about which of those two streets I'm prepared to walk down. So ultimately, risk is a complex calculation based on multiple factors fed, in this case, into a mental algorithm. Am I prepared to walk down that street? So let's e extend it into this thing we call entitlement. Now, if you were listening last time, you will know that one of my personas I introduce you to is I am a whitewater kayaking instructor. So here's my example. And my, and my team used to get fed up with me using kayaking examples for risk, but they work. So I am me, my sporting persona. And in my sporting persona, I'm going to take a scout, so under 18, kayaking at the Lee Valley Olympic 2012 Whitewater Centre. So I need, I need to be able to offer a set, a number of attributes, all from their authoritative sources as a set, immutably linked to me with a known level of certainty, normally photo in this case, if we're doing paper. So first of all, proof I've over 18, that's legally responsible. Yep. DVLA, uh, my driver's license has my date of birth on it. Um, so, and obviously gray hair goes a long way. <clears throat> Um, I need to be a current British canoeing level three or better whitewater kayak coach with qualification issued by the authority to source, which is British canoeing. Obviously, it's a scout, so I need a current scouting kayaking permit issued by the scouts. I need a, a, a level three 16 hour first aid qualification for my British canoeing and my scouting to be valid as qualifications. I need to be DBS checked because I'm working in the UK with an under 18 year old. And finally, I need a Lee Valley uh, user card proving that actually I've passed their test and I'm able to use their course. So the entitlement requirement to take little Jimmy here canoeing at Lee Valley is all of these. 
issued not by someone else, issued by the authoritative source for those particular attributes that I'm asserting. <clears throat> so what are the lessons from this example? So each assertion is from a different authoritative source. Why? Because organizations don't want to maintain attributes for which they're not authoritative, because non-authoritative attributes go stale. They're near impossible to maintain. Look at your IT systems, look at your IAM systems inside your organization, and actually how many of those attributes are actually totally out of date, or your HR system. Yeah, and more importantly in this case, yes, if something horribly goes wrong and little Jiminy ends up getting hurt or killed, then there's an inquest. And if I'm shown actually to be taking little Jimmy out with stale attributes, there, those organizations who issued that would have a liability risk if found out to be wrong. Thus, the entitlement check, am I entitled to take them canoeing, should be carried out in real time or as near real time as possible. Yes, binary assertions, he has a current first aid qualification go stale because my first aid qualification only lasts for three years. So it should be avoided anyway. So we should be asking for assertions as if I'm canoeing with, if I'm taking him in a week's time is, is my first aid qualification valid until whatever the date in a week's time is. And also as the coach on top of all of that, I do a risk assessment using external environmental risk data. So it's an outdoor course. What's the weather like? Is each participant, is little Jimmy actually up to canoeing on this particular course? Do we have the correct safety equipment and processes in place? Am I briefed by Lee Valley staff on any current issues or changes or actually new processes since I last taught there? And finally, we do a dynamic risk assessment if we start to get freezing hail, do we end the, ses the session? Or thunder, actually, if you have lightning, basically we get everyone off the water. So is there a hypothermia risk or is there a lightning risk or whatever? We end the session early. So all of that feeds into our risk equation. So if we feed that into my risk triangle here, <clears throat> then what do we get? We get the context the understanding of the attributes presented by the entity. We have a set of entitlement rules that says if the entity can present all these assertions <clears throat> from the correct issuing authority, then we'll permit it, whatever it is, to happen. We also feed a bunch of external information. Obviously, this is an IT set, so, you know, are they geolocated? Do we trust them? Is this what they normally do, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a fun bunch of external information we're going to feed into the context and the entitlement rules. And that allows us to derive risk. It happens with a known level of risk. So if it goes ahead, if we match the entitlement rules, if we feed in the external environmental stuff, then we can do it. And it's a known level of risk. It's not risk-free, never is. But we know what the risk is. <clears throat> and actually, if you go to uh, CSA, guide, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance Guidance version 3, actually, we wrote that into there as entitlement. Entitlement is making a risk-based decision about access, in this case, to data or systems based on the trusted identity and attributes of all the entities and the components in the transaction chain. Pretty straightforward. If uh, you go to uh, Domain tw uh, Cloud Security Alliance version four, actually that little, uh, that little reminder has gone out of there, but the title has stayed the same. Domain 12 in CSA guidance version four is identity entitlement and access management. In other words, we take the identity attributes in context, feed them into entitlement, and then say, yeah, if you're entitled, you meet the criteria, then we will grant you access. So here's your uh, slightly better definition, a set of rules or an algorithm which, if met, entitles two entities to transact. Something to happen. <clears throat> So this leads us to a set of principles. 
So the first one, if you're consuming the attributes, first of all, risk is temporal. It will change over time. Really important, when we get onto the session on, on zero trust, it's one of the big things that we're enforcing, you know, we're talking about in zero trust is continual, continual reassessment of the entitlement criteria. Yeah, risk is temporal, will change over time. Attributes need to be consumed in the full knowledge of the entity that signed them. Remembering that some attributes could be self-asserted. Yeah, I'm six foot one and a half or even derived. Yeah, looking at him. Oh, yeah, he's just over six foot. So, yeah, OK, fine. That's one I've derived. Um, attributes must be consumed in the full knowledge of the entity presenting them and the level of immutability between myself and the attribute that's asserting them. Again, not a binary one. Um, multiple attributes from potentially disparate personas are asserted. You need to have an acceptable level of proof that all the attributes are linked to that single entity. So in the case of my canoeing example, obviously the face matches to Paul Simmons, matches to all my other bits of paper. And only, obviously, we got the privacy one at the end, only request attributes required to support your risk calculation or meet your legal obligations, such as KYC. As the intermediary, if you're handling these as an intermediary, never, ever turn a variable into a binary. You need to pass on the attribute and the provenance of that attribute so that the entity actually taking the risk can evaluate the whole picture. If you're the issuer and signer of the attributes, then only hold, maintain, and sign attributes for which you're truly authoritative. And ideally, give them, in this case, to me. Yeah, I can sit here and open my wallet and go, here's my British canoeing qualification on a piece of cardboard or on a, on a piece of plastic which has British canoeing on top of it. Yeah, so ideally, give them to the entity that actually they pertain to so they can assert them. As the presenter of the attributes, obviously only present them in a privacy enhancing matter and understand why those attributes are being requested. And if you don't, if you're not happy with why they're being requested, then walk away from the transaction. So two final thoughts as we finish up. The first one is evaluation of risk is not about just evaluating the asserted attributes it also needs to factor in as much supporting information as possible. And the second one is actually maintaining groups of attributes in a persona that are tied to an authoritative source have major security advantages. So if the authoritative source only maintains their attributes, for example, you know, when I worked for AstraZeneca, then AstraZeneca maintained a bunch of attributes about me that pertains to AstraZeneca, my staff number, my level within AstraZeneca, which department I worked for, all of that. If they are breached or their signing key is compromised, then they have to reissue the key and attributes at their cost. But none of my attributes, because they shouldn't be holding them from my other personas, should be compromised. So nothing else is affected. For inclusion, your takeaway points from this session. Context is key to making good risk-based decisions. Consuming attributes of an entity from authoritative sources enables you to make much better risk-based decisions. The entitlement process, remember that word, drives the process and is fed from attributes, but also can include environmental attributes as well. Taking trusted attributes, should say attributes, not attributed, from multiple authoritative sources, we can add level of confidence in the entitlement process. And finally, by adding, by understanding this thing called we call immutable binding, how well is am I connected to those attributes that I am presenting to you? We can add a level of confidence to the entitlement process. And while actually my examples today have been about generally about humans and have little to do with IT, if we understand them properly, allows us to design better and more secure IT systems, which is what we're going to be talking about on the next session. So stay tuned. Um, if you want some more resources, 
Um, the content of what I've been talking about today are actually out of these two blogs. So you can uh, go and read up on them. And yeah, this is what's next in the series. So uh, yeah, 26th of September, join us this time next week. Uh, identity challenges uh, as we take some of this stuff I've been talking about into the IT world and what are the challenges involved with that. Thank you so much, Paul. Right, okay, that brings us to one o'clock. So um, thank you so much and see everyone next week, 12.30, number three. Look forward to it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.